Well, good morning to our friends in Australia and Asia right now, uh, which means a good evening from the beautiful Chicagoland area where it's uh, sunny. Well, it was sunny. Sun has uh, pretty much gone down now. Uh, Pete and Mac, you know, hopefully you had a good dinner. And, uh, you know, uh, we got a call. We had a late call today. This was nice, you know. Didn't have that usually early morning call and all our morning meetings and, you know, get ready for an afternoon session. We had like the whole day off. It's like I could have taken two shows today if I had to. I, we were actually doing shows. But the the uh, tonight's topic, this morning's topic is um, around uh, LQ and Agent IC. You know, uh, like we are so proud of, um, we don't just talk about a topic once we keep talking about topics because there's so much to it. Uh, number one, number two, from the, what, what did we start this guys? Five weeks ago now, roughly? Um, roughly like a year or two ago. It felt, it felt like a long time ago, but you know, imagine the first time that we touched on LQ and agent and IC, and everybody was just discovering this idea of the wor remote workspace, right? And what, what the remote workflow was. And all of a sudden people went, Oh, you know this 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 comms thing uh, is kind of works, and oh, the internet. I think we'll keep using that, and and all of a sudden we watched that explosive growth of of that. I can only imagine, Rom, at Clearcom, the number of agent IC licenses that uh, oh, started yeah. to pour out of the building about the time there. Because I don't think this is going to end in two weeks, so we should probably think a little differently now. And uh, now we're at the next step of thinking just a little differently again. Um, and we were even before this, we were talking about um, uh, unique applications of, of these devices and, and a lot of the virtual software that's out there now that is like, okay, well, well, just you kind of run this, you run this, you run that. And now all of a sudden we're like, well, I think maybe we want to figure out how to start tying these things together more. Um, but before we keep going, we see our uh, attendees are joining us. Um, let's talk about a little Q&A, because Rom loves <laughs> Q&A. I mean, you, yeah. Rom, win, man. I not We've not had anybody other than maybe Pete that has that, 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 that interaction, right, that's of, of just whatever the audience is struggling with information-wise, jump in on that. So Mac has some new guidelines, though, that I really like. Um, <laughs> Uh, but not, can be not really kind because we got new guests with us. We have new guests. Well, we, have new, we have new guests, so they're new now. Be Pacific. But be Pacific. They, yes, exactly. be specific. <laughs> I, I, I see we have some old friends who, who know the drill, but there's uh, probably new friends as well from, uh, from uh, Asia and Australia. Uh, so to ask questions, and we encourage you to ask questions that's what it's all about <clears throat> in your go to webinar control panel there's a little pull down menu that says questions and in that pull down there is a little box for you to type your questions in we will see the questions right there we, we right will there, see the, right there we will see the questions it's uh unlikely that everyone else will see the questions that you ask or the comments that you make because um, we're the only ones who actually see them unless there's a simple question that one of us can answer right away which we will answer and respond to everyone and then everyone will see that question and we'll see the answer but when you ask a question please be specific about what what you're asking about because we, we will certainly not get to the question immediately when you enter it. And it may be five minutes, it may be 10 minutes later. And if you're not specific about exactly what point you're um, questioning, it's gonna be very hard to know what you're referring to because that will have all happened five minutes ago. So please be sp specific in your questions. If you have comments to make, same thing, be specific in your comments so that we know what, it is, what it's about because we may not see that immediately at the moment you enter it. But please ask lots of questions. That's really, really what it's all yeah. about. And and um, we will follow up with questions. If we don't, we will try to get to all of them. If we don't get to all of them, we will try to at least get to every topic. 
And if there are questions that we don't get to, if we run out of time and can't get to them all, we will uh, reach out to Ram and Paul to answer them. And we will have a question list that will be downloadable along with the video in the archive in about 24 hours. That's all I've got to say. And that's that. <laughs> So exactly. when we first, and when this we is first, being recorded and is will be available for streaming in about 24 hours and downloading screaming. on YouTube shortly after. When we first, uh, uh, the three of us thought about the title for this this show, uh, uh, Agent IC meets Agent 99. It was it didn't really think much about it, but it turns out that's actually the the name they named it. Agent 99 in Roman num numerals is IC. So, in some circles, yeah. In some circles, I see. I see for intercom, and and it was <laughs> close enough for rock and roll to be a Roman s, more of an Italian number than a Roman number. I think, yeah. Close enough. Close yeah. enough. Yeah. Works in New York. So what can yeah. I say? Yeah. So, uh, 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 Rom, why don't you just uh, run out in the field and kick kick the ball? Okay. All right. So here we are. Um, uh, as uh, Kelly was mentioning, there's been a very, very big explosion of uh, interest in all kinds of IP products, and um, I'm thrilled that Paul is joining us here for, um, which way are you? That way. Okay. <laughs> Everything's backwards. Um, uh, to be able to, first of all, you know, we have a lot of people who are here uh, joining us um, uh, from Australia and New Zealand and uh, Asia Pacific, and um, you know all, all you Aussies out there, you can feel very comfortable in the fact that uh, Paul speaks your language. Uh, I talk New York, so uh, even though I live in California, you know you never get rid of that accent. Um, but you know there are different regional applications that we've seen. You know, Clearcom is a worldwide company, and I travel around the world, and I've. I'm always impressed with the way that applications work in one place might be a little bit different in other places. So um, among the many reasons that we're privileged to have Paul here, that's also one of them. Um, additionally, um, Clearcom came out with Agent IC some time ago, and uh, a lot of people had it. It was a you know an interesting product. Uh, yeah, we might be able to use this for that. Some television stations kind of caught on quickly because now they could use uh, cell phones for uh, IFBs and the shooter could go out and, and be not only on the comms, but also have a point to point to the shaders panel and all that kind of stuff. Agent IC originally lived on our matrix products. Um, when LQ came out, and for those of you who don't know, LQ is a box uh, that allows you to take uh, intercom uh, either two wire or four wire or radios, two way radios, uh, or even just plain old B flat audio, line level audio input output. And um, uh, LQ by itself, it uses a codec called Opus, which as many of you know, is very, very cool. It's scalable. I can have one, uh, I can have one bit rate going in one direction and I can have a different, more latent or less latent coming in the other direction. So for example, uh, I know that there are golf applications where they were using uh, LQ boxes, the little throw down boxes for uh, mics and IFBs and at, at all the T boxes. Uh, as long as the microphone is brought up to line level, it, it can go across. Obviously you would have to slow the, um, the transport down uh, so you get the highest quality audio and the audio can be very high quality in LQ. Uh, but the fact of the matter, the fact of the matter is uh, the, the audio from the microphone would get to the truck before the camera, the camera's video did. So everything was hunky dory. However, IFB has to happen now or as close to now as possible. So we could uh, scale down the, um, the signal coming back in quality but reduce the latency dramatically so the IFB would be almost instantaneous. And when they said go, go would happen. And it wouldn't be like, uh, you know, Christiane Amanpour, you know, being asked a question and continuing to shake her head till, you know, the world turned green and then answer the question because there's so much latency. So that was a great, great uh, 
breakthrough for, for us in a lot of ways. Um, where things became very interesting is uh, within the last uh, year, year and a half or so, we were able to add H&IC clients to an LQ box, which means that now you can buy client licenses up to eight per box uh, for an LQ device, no matter what size it is or what flavor it is. And by flavor, I mean two-wire, four-wire, or the DB9 that's used for radios or GPIO kind of stuff, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and not only can it uh, support eight clients of uh, Agent IC, it can also support eight SIP clients. We're not going to dive too much into the SIP stuff today, but uh, for those of you who are familiar with SIP, and uh, you, you know how groovy a little thing that is, if I could go retro again for a moment. Um, and for those of you who aren't, uh, when we say SIP, think of your office phone, the VoIP phone that sits on your desk that's not connected copper to the, to the telephone company's line, but is actually coming through a network. So um, it's become very powerful and it's very cool and a lot of neat applications. Um, I'd like to take a minute to throw it over to Paul and uh, ask some of the cool applications that you've seen recently and uh, how uh, some of those things might be able to help us all here as we learn about the LQ and Agent IC. Paul? Yeah, well, I, I agree. The Agent IC, a lot of people saw it as a bit of a gimmick when it first came out. No one could quite place it. But okay. in the last month, it's uh, definitely exploded. I um, mean, I've been lucky enough to use it for the last couple of years um, for jobs around Asia Pacific and even hosting, you know, like having agents connecting from say Singapore back to Sydney, the latency is really quite manageable. Often it's um, lower than the cell phone calls. Oh yeah. Uh, and LQ is much the same. I've used LQ um, within venues to interface to click on products and other products because it's, uh, it's just four wire audio at the end of the day, um, but also across the country and across the world. Uh, it's, it's just such an easy and approachable product. The interface is quite straightforward, so you don't need to be a comms engineer to make it work. <laughs> and the, as you say, the Opus audio quality, it's great. Like there's a lot of people using it to transport audio, you know, like production audio, not just intercom which is becoming, as in the, our current world where no one can go anywhere, the whole remote work and remote production, we need tools like this to just make the jobs keep happening. And the having, as you, you already mentioned, the, having the direct buttons and the, the flexibility to have an actual comm system using Agent IC rather than, uh, you know, like you see a lot of events companies using something like WhatsApp. And that's great if everyone's happy to be in one big party line chat. But as soon as you want to do a show and you need to break out, show IFBs, have a tech chat, it, those non-production apps, just they just don't scale. They don't, they don't really work for what we're trying mm -hmm. to do. Yeah. Well, interestingly, um, as, as you were starting to speak there, uh, Marty came up with a, a question that's uh, actually right up your alley there, Paul. Uh, Marty is asking, uh, is ClearCom going to offer cloud-based comm matrix? So, you know, we've been talking about this for quite some time. Those of you who know our buddy Richard Spicer, he's been flying this flag for as long as I've been at ClearCom, and that's since uh, 2007, maybe even before. Um, and uh, ClearCom does not have plans. We're a hardware company, and at this point, you know, I will not name the well from which we will not drink, but at this point, we're not doing such a thing. But I know that there are some pretty smart people out there who are uh, actually doing little uh, kind of farms that, uh, well, why don't you tell them about it, Paul? Yeah, it's a nice background image there, Ron. Um, someone sneaking <laughs> through your house. Uh, Always chilling so for you, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So thanks to my friends at the PA people who have way too much ClearCom gear. I'm not sure if it's the most in the world. It could be as far as a rental house. Way to learn. Um, we yeah, are able to have a, we've got an Omega frame sitting in a data center in Sydney. 
Um, so it's on a one gig pipe and it's got some IVC cards in it and agent IC licenses. And that's how I've been able to deliver uh, events around like locally and around Asia Pacific. Um, so even in the last couple of weeks, we've had um, clients in Singapore logging in. So we literally send them the login details and they're just coming straight in off the hardware they've already got. So with um, they've been stuck in lockdown like most of us around the world and people have been able to work with the equipment they have on hand rather than having to get them any hardware. Um, but similarly as, I mean, it's slightly off where we started on topic, but the LQ boxes can also connect direct to a matrix frame. So it does add additional functionality. Right. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's, um, it'd be great to have a virtual matrix, not to have a, uh, need to have a giant piece of hardware sitting in a data center. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, that's the way we have to do it. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, works, works pretty well when it's on a, on a really solid internet connection. Right. And, you know, um, there are a lot of very creative people who are, um, you know, rental houses and uh, people who have gear uh, who can hold on to it right now because LQ is quite the commodity in the COVID world. Um, but uh, being able to either have uh, LQ devices or matrices that can also host stage and ICs, um, there's great opportunities out there for, you know, entrepreneurial types to be able to make a little agent IC farm that can be rented out. You know, as we will see when we dive into it, and those of you who are familiar with it, um, we, uh, you know, all you have to do is uh, change the password on a client and your previous customer can no longer log in to what they rented. Everybody can get the app. As a matter of fact, if you yeah. don't have the app, I encourage you to go wherever it is, you know, whatever higher power you worship, and uh, go go to that app store, you know, the, the Google Play or whoever, wherever you go, uh, what is it called, iTunes, what is it for Apple, the Apple Store? App Store, the yeah. Apple, Core, Apple Store, and uh, just do a search for ClearCom or Agent IC or ClearCom Agent IC. The app is free. You can download it on your, um, on your phone or your tablet or your watch, or your, you know, there you go. Yeah, Peter's yep, showing there it to is. you right now. And uh, it comes live with a demo, and that's actually what uh, Peter was just showing us. And you can play around with it, and actually with your buddies, you can you can actually have comms. The really neat thing about this, and Paul mentioned it just a moment ago, um, is, is is the, the latency component. Um, I think, just about everybody by now has been on a cell phone or mobile phone conversation and walked into a room and realized that the person you're talking to on that phone call is right there in front of you. And, you know, they're talking to you and you're seeing their lips moving, but it has nothing to do with what you're hearing in your ear because by the time that call goes over across all the lines that it has to go to the company, this, that, back and forth, Kalamazoo and back, there's quite a bit of latency. However, uh, this one of the schemes that we're using for Agent IC is instead of, uh, as I understand it, instead of using all that VoIP uh, part of the bandwidth, we're really attaching more to the data, if I understand it correctly, which is moving much quicker. Plus, all of our, um, uh, our, our network stuff, um, we talk about, and I hope I don't get shot down for this, but we talk about uh, uh, IV Core, which is a technology that we use that mixes at the client, not at the server. And all of these things conspire to really bring the latency down. And it's, uh, and on top of that, the audio quality is very, very good. So you should try it out. Um, where it's monetized, as far as ClearCom is concerned, is if you want it to attach to your system, in other words, your wired system, or your wireless, however, whatever kind of comms you have, or if you want to use it for audio transport, um, you have to buy clients for that device. So if it's a matrix uh, system, there would be an IVC32 card or an IPA card, EIPA card, which those two cards can host the agent IC clients or mobile clients as we call them in that world, uh, or the LQ box, which is uh, a little bit more of the entry level. So. When we're talking about the matrix productivity, it's it's incredible. It it's an actual intercom panel, just like you would attach to your matrix, either with you know analog connection or or through some some network connection. And 
Anything that a panel can do, the agent I see pretty much can do. If you want to have to talk on a party line, you can talk on a party line. If you want to talk on a group or a fixed group, um, you can do that. If you want to talk to an IFB, you can do that and actually interrupt the IFB. If you've set up controls in your LQ box or your, well, we're talking about the matrix now. If you set up controls or relays on the matrix, you can engage them. You know, you want to launch a missile or uh, trigger a digicard or a, or, or a switcher wipe or flick the lights in the lobby uh, when the intermission is almost over in the theater. You can do that all from your phone, just like you could from a panel. Um, it's a really powerful little tool. And, you know, our, our uh, engineer monkeys are always very, very adept at making cool new features that come out from here from time to time. And uh, upgrades are always free. And we are, uh, we're thrilled with, with the way it's progressing. And right now in the COVID world, it's been a lifesaver. By the way, Marty, by the way, I don't want to leave him out, is also saying that the, the, we used Agent IC quite a bit for the webcast operations from the Democratic Convention in 2016. Way to get that little resume bullet point in there, Marty. That's a good one. And it's a good one. We ran it uh, off a Delta, oh, so this was a, a matrix, a Delta frame in Washington, D.C. So, you know, again, it, it, you can use it on your local network, uh, with maybe with the Wi-Fi in the room. Or if you open up, and we'll talk about this in a bit, you can open up a, an external uh static IP address that goes to the public internet. And in the case of LQ, you want to open up ports 655 and port 80, TCP, UDP. Um, once it's on the public internet now, anywhere there's the LTE phone coverage, you've got coverage. So, you know, if you're an engineer and uh, you have to go to the transmitter site, you can still be on the intercom. Or if you're having a bad day and you need some mental health, uh, you can go to the beach. We can't give you the monitor wall, but we can give you the comms, and um, it's it's a it's an awesome product. And like I say, right now in the COVID world, it's it's really really kicking it. Um, so we don't have a lot of questions so far. So what I think we might want to do is talk a little bit about this. Uh, dive in a little on the on the handout that uh, you have. And again, you'll see that handout. I hope my finger is pointing the right way. Uh, right over here in this in, in that little sidebar, if you expand it out, that little there's a little red uh, PDF um, uh, icon, and it says ClearCom handout for LQ AIC webinar, and with uh, with this month. So without uh, further ado, let's take a look at that, and let me see if I can find it here because I'm not the most adept at finding things on this list, and I don't know why. I used to be better at it. Wow. Let's, I don't see it there. Maybe it's because it's a Word and not a PDF, Rom, because I, I have it as a Word document. Uh, it shows up as a PDF in my in my in your world. Bar. In your world, yeah. That's because. Hang yeah. on one second. Let's see where I have it. Yeah, I have it as a. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Just uh, you know, if I had the Jeopardy theme played up, I'd. It's under the little pull down that says handouts. Yeah, it is there, but I, I, I need to pull it down from this thing. And unfortunately, uh, what I did is I didn't prepare properly. I'll be, uh, there we go. Okay, there we go. Now you can see it. So this is uh, our little thing, by the way, um, as, as you saw at the opening of the show, we have all of our email addresses uh, uh, available to you. And at the end of the webinar today, you'll see it again. But um, I put mine here. So if you want to, you know, you can uh, um, give me a, a drop me a line or a smoke signal or whatever you like. Uh, also, keep in mind that I'm, I'm not ashamed to do this. Um, if you care and you want to call me, I'm going to give you my cell phone number. So get a pencil and paper. And uh, if for those of you out of the country, uh, the U.S. rather, obviously you're in your country, um, but it'd be plus one for the U.S., area code 510-919-2732. Of course, um, you know, as you'll see uh, later on in the slide, you'll see Paul's email address. And for those of you in Australia, you'll probably understand him a little, whole lot better than listening to my ungodly New York talk. So there you go. All right. So 
in the hand that I started a little bit of history about Clearcom, Charlie Button was the guy who actually invented the the intercom belt pack back in the 1960s. He was working for the Doobie Brothers and Carlos Santana, uh, Grateful Dead. I, I mean, anybody who was anybody. This guy was he was one of the midwives of rock and roll. And uh, he kind of got tired of having to pass notes back and forth from his front of house mixing position to the monitor guy. And as the shows got more and more popular, it became more evident that they needed some kind of communication. And the only thing available in those days was things along the line of, um, I think, uh, what was the guy's name, Hanley? I, I can't remember now, I'm having a senior moment. But he had a kind of a McCurdy kind of a system, which was all four wire, and it required really thick cable, and all kinds of cabling, and all kinds of boxes here and there, and is very uh, unwieldy, and also expensive. And you know, back then, rock and roll was, uh, you know, they didn't really have it going on as far as budgets were concerned. And Charlie invented that first silver belt pack, the uh, RS-100, uh, and then became the 100A, and onward and upward. And I can tell you, Charlie still today comes in, well, not today, but he's still uh, in, in our time. Uh, he doesn't come into the office anymore, like all of us, but he uh, still works from his home and is designing stuff, all the all the modern products we have pretty much have to pass muster with Charlie before they go out the door. Um, the guy's a genius and uh, quite an interesting guy. Anyway, let's start talking a little bit about LQ. And by the way, Paul, anytime you want to chime in, just uh, just jam in. I'm not seeing your picture yeah, right we'll now. Do. Okay, good, thanks. So, LQ, it was a, it's a linking product and, uh, you know, just to, to let the family secrets go, we called it Link at first, and then uh, Microsoft had a product called Link, and lawyers got involved. So we decided on calling it something a little sexier, so it's called LQ. And uh, it started life as this, as you see at the very top there, that LQ, that small half-rock box. Um, and we, we, we affectionately call that the throwdown box. You know, we really needed a product that could you could take an intercom plug it in, blow it over a network, and then plug it in at the other side and be able to, you know, interconnect. And this was the idea, and this is how, you know, how how the LQ product line started life. And as you see here, and I don't know if you see my cursor moving around, but you'll see, yeah, see uh, okay, so this first backplane here, the LQ2W2, that means two ports of two wire. And as you can see here, we have two XLRs, and I know this is going to be boring for some of the people who've worked with it for a while, but just bear with us for a moment or two so we can familiarize those who are not quite up to snuff on the product line. Um, we have these two ports. Now, in LQ, you'll, you'll notice that our ports come in groups of two, especially important in the two-wire world. Clearcom two-wire, uh, that old-fashioned analog uh, party line system that, you know, powers itself. Um, there are a couple of different flavors of it in the world. One is the, that original Clearcom, and the other is the RTS protocol. Now, in the RTS world, they have the potential for two channels uh, on a single XLR connector. Now, Clearcom, uh, eventually, we decided, okay, we'll do that. And the reason we didn't at first, because Charlie, you know, being the meticulous audio guru that he was, did not want to put an audio plus on the same XLR pin that there was 30 volts of power for noise floor reasons. So, um, and you will notice a difference between the RTS and the Clearcom as far as noise floor is concerned. Um, not the least of which though, and some, and some of it is actually compensated for in, in the RTS world, <coughs> excuse me, because they're, um, and every time I cough, I think people think I'm sick. It, that's the new world. Uh, um, it's 55 years of smoking, folks. Don't don't worry. Plus, it it doesn't go through the internet. I'm told. <clears throat> anyway, uh, the when, when Charlie first uh, wrote up the design for the two wire, um, we were putting these uh, on on malts on snakes with other things, including microphones and such. And he was cognizant of the fact that if a line level audio signal is a little too loud and there might be some breaks in the shield of the malt, there might be some bleed through and he didn't want that. 
So he brought the level down a little bit by somewhere close to 10 decibels from, from line level nominal. So those are the two main differences in the ClearCom protocol from the RTS protocol. Um, ClearCom does make a box that you can take two individual channels and mux them together on one um, three pin yep. XLR, but that's a different discussion. Um, anyway, so the reason we're seeing these in two conveniently is if I in my software designate those ports to be ClearCom protocol, it will be two channels, one each, one for each of the XLRs. So I could have a channel A and a channel B. In the if I designate my two wire ports to be RTS, they will both go as a set to RTS mode, and the two channels on my single three pin XLR can go into either of them. And they, effectively, they really kind of become a loop through. And in the ClearCom protocol, each one is an individual channel and they're separated. Now, I know somebody's going to think, well, wait a minute, um, can I uh, you know, have one, one a ClearCom and one an RTS? Unfortunately not. No. Uh, if you want to do that, you've got to play a different game which would be getting one of these larger one rack unit devices that has, let's say in this case, uh, four two wire ports. It also has four four wire ports. So these first two could be ClearCom and these second two could be RTS. Paul, did you have something you want to chime in with? Uh, one thing I'll say about those boxes is the, the nulling. And for those that aren't familiar with nulling, it's basically the cancellation of your voice from the incoming audio, the nulling on these boxes is really, really good. It is. Um, and that's always been a challenge when you're trying to go from party line, where the, all the audio is mixed together, to a four wire circuit, is if it's not nulled correctly, and then you send that four wire over a satellite, over internet, you end up with that echo. And especially if you're using a satellite circuit, you hear yourself back seconds later. Yeah. So one thing I really noticed going to the LQ was the auto nulling just works. And that's been really important in these remote production scenarios. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, Charlie and Naroche and uh, our engineering team really uh, hit it out of the park on that one. It's really good. And now we're starting to put it into our other products too, that same nulling circuit. One note about LQ that I, I do want to say is if now, for those of you who don't know, nulling is vital when you're connecting a two-wire device to a four-wire device. And the uh, circuitry within the LQ box works in the four-wire world. So when I plug a two-wire channel or it, even a two-wire belt pack, which I can plug right into the, into the box, it'll give me power and termination. Uh, I want to configure my system with all the wiring and hardware on the two wire side that I'm imagining I'm going to use in my show and then null it. But here's the caveat. And one thing we found in, in, in years of using these devices, um, because of uh, certain anomalies in the design and, and, and components, uh, especially with this box, actually with many other products too, but especially with this box, if you null it while it's still just warming up, in other words, you plug it in, you start plugging in your stuff, you're ready to go, you're like the golden put together dude or dudette, and you've got that system humming within you know 10 or 15 minutes and you go and null, everything is great. But about 20 minutes later, you're going to notice that that two wire is going to start to come out and null a little bit. You really want the box to reach its nominal operational temperature before the null. So what I always say is null it for sure. When you bring it up, that's fine. But again, before you go to the show, null it one more time just to ensure. And then it'll stay locked really well. But that's just a little note on nulling. Okay. Um, Anything to add on nulling from your end, uh, Mr. Paul? No, I think that pretty much covers it. Yeah, it's okay. yeah, just the fact that this is much easier to do than um, you say the uh, some of the old analog ways where you'd have to pull out your tweaker and your earpiece and uh, mm -hmm. work your way through. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. That definitely makes life easier, particularly again for if you don't have a comms tech at the other end and you're trying to work no. with your your audio team, who maybe haven't done nulling before. This just takes that off the table. And so easy. You can do it from the front menu, or you can do it from the GUI, yeah. and we'll walk through that later. Um, by the way, just talking about nulling. Nulling effectively, if you can imagine, a four wire circuit is an input and an output. A two wire circuit is one circuit that's in out it's they're both combined on those same two wires and what the nulling does in, in the telephone world that they call it uh, uh, echo cancellation what and by the way echo is not the only um, culprit when you're out of null sometimes you'll hear a little hum or buzz that might be fixed by making it a good deep null anyway um, when we're nulling we're actually taking the the input and the output or the talk and the listen and we're kind of separating them from each other kind of spraying Teflon on the one wire that they're sharing um, when we use something called side tone which most of you are familiar with side tone is the amount let's say on my belt pack that uh, I hear in my ear when I push the talk I'll hear my own voice in my ear which is kind of like insurance for us when I hear myself in my ear, that means other people can hear me. So it's a good thing to use yeah. that side tone. Don't don't turn it down. Um, we like side tone because it keeps us from having to rewrite our resumes, as I like to say, because you don't say the things about the boss when the boss can actually hear you. So side tone is good. What side tone actually is, is at that device, at that endpoint, we are locally, only at that device, taking it a little bit out of no. So what I'm saying is actually flushing back to me once it's engaged in the circuit. So a little piece of trivia that'll get your beer in a bar one day. Okay. Yeah. So but continuing on. Got a good sorry. question there on nulling. Yeah. Uh, yep. Can nulling be done without annoying the crew? <laughs> Which is a great question. Yeah. So well, first of all, crews are there to be annoyed, and that's you know one of the few perks we have as comms guys in the world. But the answer is sadly no. Um, and for a couple of reasons, I say no. First of all, the splash tones that we hear in in this. So when you engage the null, if you did listen, you would hear like a sh that sort of sound. Um, it's not the most unpleasant thing to hear. It's not gonna, you know, one of these things where you gotta pull your headsets off and you know go nuts. Um, however, um, I would say. Uh, the more important reason to, to not have the crew engaged at, at that time is because when you do your nulling, and this is very important, when you do your nulling, you do not want to have um, anybody talking on the channel that you're nulling on, on, on any of the paths that are connected, either four wire devices that might be connected to that channel or the two wire devices that you're actually nulling that product. So all talk paths have to be turned off. And if people are engaged or have their headsets on, they might be tempted to talk while the nulling is going on and that's gonna screw the pooch for you a little bit. So it's the annoyment part is actually a feature for us to keep people away from the comms while we know the system. It's just how we designed it. So you get the heck off the comms so we can do our job. But yeah. uh, and, and another it, feature that Marty brings up about side tone is you can stop people from talking too loudly by giving them a side tone. Yes, oh, that's a good, right, exactly. Just like yeah. we do in, in the music world where you know the guitar player is screaming loud guitar, what you do is you just turn his guitar up in his monitor a little bit so make him play a little bit quieter. So these are yeah, all the same stealthful. Concept. Yeah, yeah, these are all the little stealthful tricks that we, uh, that we play. Can you still see my screen or did I lose it? Yeah, we can. That's we can. Okay. Okay, good. All right. So, um, and by the way, I'm going to be counting on you, uh, uh, Paul, please to, as soon as a question comes in, chime in with it, because right now I don't see the questions the way I've got this. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I'm keeping an eye on that there. Cheers. Cheers. Okay. How do you like that you know, for a New Yorker to say cheers? That's pretty evolved, I think. <laughs> All right. So, um, uh, so this first iteration here was the first box we came in out with. It was the, the two-wire throwdown box. It has these two ports. It has two uh, RJ45 or actually Ethercon connectors. Uh, one, as you can see here, is for PoE. I can actually f I can power up this little box with PoE, and I don't even need my outboard uh, DC brick that I normally would bring in for the 12 volts that's just to the right of it. 
Um, and I could even, with it powered PoE, I can even put a couple of belt packs on this and fire them up. Um, it's that efficient a box. And by the way, the new 700 series belt packs, the Clearcom, the, the new ones are really, really uh, incredible in their reduction of, of current draw. I think Charlie designed them to be about 75% less current draw than we used to have on the old boxes or the uh, like you'll see on the uh, uh, RTS BP 325s. So whereas we used to be able to say, okay, on a, let's say a, a power supply, you could run 30, maybe push it to 40 belt packs. You can now put over a hundred belt packs on a, on, a, on a big boy one amp power supply. On a device like this, when it's plugged in PoE, I'd say you could put maybe two or three. If you plug it into electricity using that uh, wall wart, the, the 12 volt adapter, now you can you can probably, I don't know that we published this, but you could probably put up to 10 belt packs of the 700 series. Five, yeah. Four or five belt packs of the 600, 500 or 100 or the, um, or the BP uh, 325s. Okay. I do see a question here. Does it help if the head is blocking the audio from the ear to the mic? Uh, in what regard is, is, I'm not quite sure if I understand that question. Uh, it could I be a bad. I it, think that was in regard to knowing too loud. Oh, okay. Ah, okay. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. All right. All right. So uh, the next box down here is a really interesting one. Uh, we don't get to use this a lot, but it's very, very cool. And matter of fact, right now, uh, we're involved in a big project for a broadcast system that is using these. You'll notice that instead of having the, the, the RJ45, which we use for our four wire, or the uh, XLR three pin that we use for two wire, it has a, a D sub connector, it's a DB9. What these are, is this is the LQ4W G2. In other words, it's four wire, but it's a GPI enabled device. Again, two for the two ports. And what we can do here is a variety of things. Um, first thing that comes to mind is I can take a two way radio. Those of you familiar with the ClearCom product, the TW47 or the FOR22 for our matrices, know that you can connect a two way radio, a walkie talkie into one of these devices and have it be a member of a party line that is that is existing in your wired or wireless system. All that's required is something to kick that relay to make the key happen on the radio. So I would take a radio, like one of my walkie talkies, and I would make a cable that goes from a, I would take a female DB9, which that's a male there, and obviously we wanna keep that kind of connectivity going. Um, and uh, we have the four wire audio, so two wires for output, two wires for input to the device and from the device. And then we have uh, two more wires that we'll use to, uh, uh, that we would leave to a normally open circuit that would close when we push a call signal along with our talk. And that way we can key the radio remotely from our panels, from our belt pack. And um, obviously a radio being simplex, it can only listen until it's talking. And it's the same thing with my radio talking back to the radio users. This is really popular in house of worship applications where they're doing a lot of work with people who are on radios, uh, public safety applications um, in big arena or arenas or stadium. Uh, you know, where the, uh, the, let's say camera five is getting beer poured on them from somebody in the stands. They can say something to the director over the intercom. The director can go to his or her panel and push a button that will now engage a two-way radio that's talking to the security people. And they can send, uh, you know, the big burly guys up to take care of the beer spiller. Um, all kinds of applications like that, um, medical applications, anywhere you can think of anything you need a relay closure for. Additionally, besides that, we do a lot of work in aerospace, and you guys may do something like this creatively, uh, where you want to kick a relay, you want to you want to engage a GPI, GPO, uh, some kind of function that you need uh, this this sort of functionality for. It's right there on the DB9. It's very useful. And of course, yeah, another application. Yep. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say another application is if you get two of the units with the DB9s, mm -hmm. you can essentially put them back to back to remote, say, UHF radio rack. So you can come 
relay in along with your four wire audio, take that across your network or across the internet and then relay back out again into your radio. So we've I've worked with a lot of broadcasters who are doing that simply using the two LQ boxes as an extension out of their truck. And of course that then works with any brand. It doesn't matter what equipment is in the truck, as long as they can do a relay and audio in and out, you can use the, the LQ as a remoting tool to be able to put yeah. repeat wherever they need, on top of the top of a building, top of a bridge, whatever you need for the coverage. Right. Interesting application I'll bring up that we're doing right now with the Tegna group of stations here in the United States. Again, because of the COVID situation and they've got the producers who want to work from home and the graphics person is working from home and they're all using Age and IC, but with an LQ box, um, you don't have the full functionality of a matrix like you would if you were using Age and IC on an IVC32 or an IPA card. So what we're doing is uh, there are people who, believe it or not, are using RTS matrices. <laughs> That's okay. It's a big world and there's room for everybody. But what we're doing is we've set up, and, and my buddy uh, Mitchell Boyce uh, the, designed this system along with some other uh, of our application people, um, where we will we'll have a talk to a port, okay, to a channel rather, and we'll associate a an, what we call it an event it, it's it's like a like a a control, control we'll associate yeah. a control with that particular channel and then we take the control points we take the four wire from the db9 and we go into the atom port okay and we bring that to a panel that we populate with different ifbs and we take the controls and we go into the portion of the atom frame that can take gpi and then what, what uh, the producer will do is leave the talk latch so the talk path is always open there, but when he or she hits the event button on their agent IC client, it triggers the GPI that triggers the atom frame to trigger the, uh, the interrupt for the, that IFB. And then of course, the, because the interrupt is happening, the um, atom matrix is now allowing that already open talk path to go to the talent. Um, you know, and there are a million different cool applications that you can think of yep. that you can do with these devices. It's a very neat device. Okay, and the last one obviously is our four wire device. It's two ports of four wire. Now it looks like it's got, you know, at first glance, oh, there, what do you got, four NICs there? No, it's the, the two on the left are port A and port B, four wire, and we'll talk about the pinouts for those in a bit. And then over here, these again are our LAN ports. Now remember, LAN 1 and LAN 2 are not two NICs. It's, think of it effectively as a pass-through. So I have a network connection, let's say, that I'll connect to my switch, maybe into the PoE one or either one if I'm not using PoE. And then I can take the other um, uh, RJ45 LAN connection and take that and daisy chain it into my laptop. So now my laptop is on that network. I've sort of ported my way in. It's just for convenience, okay? Don't put two uh, connections from a switch no. into that. You'll have a broadcast storm and it'll yeah. really make it for a long day. It's, um, not a, it's not a main and a backup. Yes, exactly, exactly. It's a, think of it like a pass-through. Okay, so now later on, a little while later, we came out with the 1RU, which we call LQR for rack manable, very clever. Um, and this, this, uh, this now allows us to have some more real estate on the back so we can have more ports. So for example, this one is called LQR 4W8. So it has four, I'm, so, it has, I'm sorry, eight four wire ports, two, four, six, eight. And it has those same two LAN ports. This time we actually get two power 12 volt inputs. It comes with the two bricks and that way you can have redundant power supplies. So, you know, we want to be in a, you know, a fail safe situation. You know, we all work in these, um, you know, high pressure world where, you know, we don't want anything to fail. So what you can do if you're really, you know, if you were toilet trained by the German governess that most of us were, you can take one of these and plug it into one circuit and another one and plug it into the other circuit just in case one of the circuits go down seamlessly, the second backup will take over and you'll, you won't notice a thing other than the lights and everything else that are going off around you. 
So yeah. another form that we have is this LQR uh, is, in this case, it's the LQ are 2w4 4w4 and i'm having again like we mentioned before i have two sets of uh two wire ports so if you're using it in clearcom mode that'd be for four channels if you're using it in rts mode it's four channels but you would only use two of these because again when once you put it into rts mode you're co-joining these two and then it has four of the four wire and again the two lands and the redundant power supply Okay, now in our handout, there's a bunch of stuff that we won't necessarily go over, but it'll be good reminders for you later on. But this, for example, is just showing our quick start guide and how we put things together in different ways. Um, as Paul mentioned earlier, you can certainly use uh, an LQ box with a matrix frame. Uh, it will work with an IPA or IVC32 card seamlessly uh, into the into the frame. If you're using, uh, let's say, an atom frame, or you're using a Riedel frame, or some other uh, matrix, you can certainly still go in as an analog four wire port, and and break out if you're using the GPIO uh, brand, the, the G model. Uh, you can you can do some creative things, but in general, it it shines the most when it's connected um, with the uh, with the Eclipse frame. But also, you can go into the two wire world. Um, and again, if I wanted to, and we'll see later, I can just have my this connected to my system either way. And at the other end of the network, I can have another box and plug a belt pack right into it. And we'll show you how that's done in a little bit. Yeah. The front pack. Uh, did you want to say something, Paul? No, no, it's, it, it is, as you say, it can literally be used as an extension. You can yeah. extend a two wire party line across the network, four wires across the network, relays across the network. Right. Um, and I see a lot of people doing that rather, sure. rather than upgrading, you know, their whole system to have to go IP, they can just right. extend one path over IP. Right. Or for, for Clearcom users who have the, the uh, old, uh, one RU Pico or uh, E32 frames, that's only yeah. analog, but this allows you to take that analog and ship it network wide. Um, another use case is uh, you're in an arena and you know the King of Siam is uh, in his luxury box and won't come down to, to the field or, or, the, or, or the court to do an interview, but you want to interview him or her, but you don't have any IO in that box. Well, you certainly have a network connection in there, so you can you can connect via network. I can take a box up there, and I can have I can plug my PL boxes right in there. I can make my mic and my IFB. All that it's fine. Again, we don't do the video part. You're gonna have to figure that one out, but there are plenty of solutions for that. Um, all right, this this shows you what the uh, the OLED on the front panel. All the devices have this little OLED, and there's a, a little navigation wheel next to it that allows you to navigate through. Um, you can do a lot of functionality right from that front panel. However, it's best to go and touch it so the, this lights up, and you'll see the IP address of the box. Once you have the IP address of the box. Then you can open up your browser as long as your uh, computer or whatever device you're connecting to it with is on the same um, um, uh, subnet, um, unless you're doing Wi-Fi, in which case you get away with some cool stuff. One thing I do want to note, and I want to bring it up right here, this right here. Um, now, as of January 1st of 2020, the state of California in which we manufacture our gear requires that any uh, browser-based GUI, browser-based software, uh, in our case, we call it the CCM, um, can no longer have a default uh, credential set of ID admin, password admin. I mean, you know, so much, we're all used to admin, admin, type it in, get in, go. Um, so. Uh, going forward, and a, a lot of boxes out there are still with firmware that th does not do this, but as we upgrade our firmware into the, the next iteration, you're going to start to see this. You're going to have to go to that front panel and look up the host MDNS address, um, and then that would be your password. The ID will still be admin, all small letters, 
but going forward, it's going to be, uh, uh, instead of admin as your password, it's going to be that MDNS address. Again, once you're in, you can change the password back to admin or Fred and Ethel yeah. or Godzilla or whatever you want. But, um, you know, make sure you write it down somewhere. Okay. Uh, well, let's move a little bit here towards the GUI. Once we talked about so, the GUI. Yes. Yeah, while you're scrolling, Marty's got a question about yeah. uh, using the LQ over bonded cellular modem. Well, I can say from my experience, it works great. Um, I did a job in Singapore back when we were allowed to travel where the hotel had promised a cabled connection but was unable to provide. Uh, yeah. Luckily, I'd taken, it was actually a Peplink uh, bonded modem yeah. and we used the Wi-Fi WAN and 4G cellular and it worked great. Um, watching the throughput of both connections it was flopping between the Wi-Fi and the cellular as the uh, as the punters turned up, but we didn't have any issue with the uh, with the LQ working over it. So no, that is definitely something that works fine. Yep. Um, yeah. What else? What, got a I think anything's Pete. faster than dial-up. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, absolutely. Uh, if I forget the LQ password, can I factory reset? I believe uh, the yes. answer to that one is yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, you can. Yes, you can. <laughs> That's the oh geez okay yeah yeah that 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 saves a lot of us absolutely um, yeah. particularly in a rental environment where the client may have changed it and it comes back and you are you can't access the right. gear anymore yeah absolutely now just so you know by the way I should have mentioned this um, and I should have printed this here and I didn't going forward uh, all all ClearCom products that uh, will be CCM enabled, in other words, using that browser-based GUI instead of the proprietary software, um, uh, will have that MDNS address printed on it somewhere probably near the serial number or maybe on the bottom of the box. Uh, so you don't have to go digging into the, into the menu to find it, but it will also live on the menu. And so... And actually, by the way, um, we're also, uh, we were talking actually today about this. We're going to also start to put uh, the actual boxes, or we're going to attempt to. It's kind of arduous for reasons that I won't go into right now, but they're actually good reasons. Um, but we're going to also put the serial number of the device into the menu. So you don't have to go digging around in the rack to find the serial number if you're looking to, you know, licenses for Agent IC or SIP or some of these other things are based on the serial number of the device. So that's gonna be really convenient for you when, if you can find it in the menu. Now, just so happens we landed on a pretty important part here. Um, connecting these devices, these LQ devices on your own little local area network is a cinch. You just plug it in, you know, you make sure they're all set on the same subnet or DHCP if that's what you like to do, you know. Uh, many of us are grizzled audio veterans who like to be in total control, so static IPs are, you know, kind of desirable, but, you know, DHCP has its place, but you can set all that from that front panel. Um, you know, it's it's a pretty easy to understand menu. Um, once, you're, once you're in, though, and you, if if you want that device to go over the public internet, which it certainly can, Obviously, things are going to slow down a little bit once it goes out into the world of, you know, all the cooties that are out there and slow things down. But um, if you want to do that, you will set up an external uh, static IP address. And this is the Rosetta Stone right here. These are the ports that you need to make sure are open TCP and TCP UDP so that once it's out on the public Internet and you have something like HNIC or SIP, now any of that any of that stuff uh, on on the is on the public internet which means in the case of agent ic it's also on lte throughout the world so you know you can go to another country and log in with the credentials that you use to log in uh, when you're home and you'll still be able to get your agent ic client up and running so just that this, this is an important little spot right here so you would get an external address. 
uh, from, you know, whatever IT God you have to worship to to get these things or, you know, I don't know, buy them a trip to Hawaii, whatever it takes. Um, and make sure that that external port, uh, in this case, uh, uh, 1007 that we're using in this case, doesn't have to be, but uh, that uh, TCP 80 and TCP UDP 655 are open. Okay. Yeah, um, and often this is the hardest part. Yeah. Particularly, you're in a, a hotel ballroom. You've you've you know spent a month talking to the in-house IT. They've promised you that public IP address. You turn up and the ports aren't forward, or there's some other issue. Uh, so yeah, oh. that is definitely the, the 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 biggest. It's I mean it's one of the reasons why um, I've got a data center because <laughs> we're now hosting that offsite. It doesn't change. Yeah, it's not cheap but it gets around this challenge of having the hosting being elsewhere. Um, if you've got really good internet at your, uh, your, your office, you might be able to host it internally at your office. There's a lot of AV companies, depends what part of the world you were in, whether your internet's any good, but that may also be an easier option than trying to do this within the venue. But yeah, if you have to do it on site, allow, allow a bunch of time to work with the IT guys. <laughs> Absolutely. It's an IT world. We just live in it. So accept. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, one of the things you're going to do when you when you set this up, you know, look, there are people who will buy one LQ box and put some agent IC license, licenses on it, plug it in, make sure it's going to that external address with all the ports open as they need to be. And that's it. They just want the one box to be able to connect maybe two wire or four wire to their system so that agent IC clients can work fine. And that's pretty simple. But more often than not, you're going to have more than one box uh, connected throughout the system. So the couple of things that you need to keep in mind, um, as we'll see when we look at the GUI, and we'll do that in a bit, um, you have six slots that we've made available. Okay, those six slots can be populated with six LQ devices, any kind of device, LQ, no matter what flavor, throw down, one rack, the, the G model, or the four wire, two wire, it can be six boxes. Also, as an aside, you can, if you want to, for those people who, out there who have used HelixNet, you can use LQ to bring you more I.O. into your HelixNet. For those of you who use uh, HelixNet, the uh, digital party line system, you'll know that you've only got a very limited amount of I.O. ports on the back of the master station. But you've got 12 channels, or you can even upgrade that to 24 channels. And, you know, if you've only got four uh, hard, uh, hardwire ports to connect, you're kind of, you know, losing out. So uh, what we've done is we've made it possible so that the HelixNet master station become, can become the master box for the LQ ring. So in that case, you'd have the HelixNet box and then five LQ devices could be stringed along in that. If you needed more than that, or if you were just, on, just using LQ and you had six boxes in the ring, but you need, let's say, nine boxes in the ring, what you'd have to do is you'd have to connect let's say four wire preferably or two wire to the other set of uh, the other set of three boxes then those three can be connected in a ring of three it's not very elegant but that's the way things are done in the practical world just so you know more often than not uh, you're not going to see more than three or four maybe five i've i've seen very few six uh six box um rings but not not to say that doesn't happen it does but uh Six is usually enough, but you know it's, you just, it certainly you know. happens in the uh, in the stadium world. Like if you're talking like opening ceremonies and that kind of oh, scale, yeah. oh, that's yeah, then yeah. And that's a whole other world. Uh, something worth mentioning on this mm -hmm. is you can have this loop of LQ or LQ and HelixNet, and then also tie that via IP into your matrix frame if you've got an right. IVC card or an IPA card. Right. So right. you don't have to burn any of your four wire ports to get into your matrix, which can right. be really helpful if you're tight on connectivity or you've got a high high channel count. 
Right. Right, right, yeah, and that, that, that I mean that that's at no cost to this port budget that we've been talking about here to four. So yes, absolutely. Um, you know, I I think having a matrix uh, talk would be if there's interest, chime in, let us know, and uh, you know we can at some later date dive a little bit deeper into the matrix application because the matrix application, I must say, uh, you know, it, it's it's very cool. It's very um, uh, productivity um, uh, uh, balance, but um, most of our, I think most of our discussion today is going to be on LQ, unless you guys want to point us in another direction, and that's what the Q&A is for, so chime in, please. I see yeah, Marty so is that, asking. I'm sorry? Yeah, I was, ahead, just Paul. noticed the question as well. So, uh, yeah, so we've got one note from Pete, that's uh, a good point. If you oh, yeah. if the helix net is a master, then it's actually using a different audio codec to right. link between the LQ units, right. which right. then does make it not compatible with going over the public internet. So right. that can be a trap if you're trying to combine helix net with LQ right. and right. internet access. Now that won't stop your agent IC clients coming in over the internet. But right. it does mean you can't have one of the LQs coming in over the internet. Right. What people often do in cases like that is they'll have a small, they'll they'll use let's say one LQ box to one or two LQ box in the HelixNet ring, and then four wire over into another uh, LQ only ring. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and another question here about VPN. Um, yeah, Marty's saying they use VPN connections to make holes in the firewall. I do exactly the same thing because it does bypass a lot of those conversations with IT. Yeah. Um, depending on which VPN technology you're using, it can often appear as just normal web traffic. Thank you very much. And you don't even need to speak to the IT guys. It just works. And particularly if you're doing a lot of flyaway kits, looking at a VPN solution can yeah. just make your life a whole bunch easier. Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. And there are parts of the world uh, that are probably listening in right now that that's just, you know, that's the way it has to be anyway. So absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. What else do we have in the questions? Okay. Michael's a gun. Hey, Michael. Uh, is it the frame with two, oh, sorry. Is it the frame with FreeSpeak 2 matters? That's probably not, typed very well. Uh, uh, are we talking about linking FreeSpeak 2 master to an LQ? We absolutely can do that with 4Wire. With 4Wire, yes, absolutely. With 4Wire, we can't do No, correct. We can't do that, no, that, correct, that, can't do that with IP. So we yeah, have to use 4Wire for that. Um, oh. Or 2Wire or for that matter, depending on which LQ wire, that's true. you have. That's true. You know, I always prefer 4. You've got more control. The input yeah. and output are separately um, attenuatable or or uh, or dimmable, which you which is really tricky in the in the two wire world. You know, if I bring my two wire up, I'm really yeah. in one direction. I'm bringing it down in the other. Mark Kennedy, who's always got the good questions out there, Mr. Mark, using one LQ box, can you walk through the connections, a mic and a a com? What are the ports you use? And then an a and an a com. Hmm. Mark, you usually type a little bit better than that, or maybe I'm just drunk. What does this mean? Any ideas, anybody? So uh, I think he's, I think he's probably just looking at just simply how do we take the four wire port and use that ah. for, I assume it's a, a microphone. So maybe we've got a remote, a remote that that contributor. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I'll show you that in a second. And a Mitchell's, it's not the Mitchell's, it's a Mitchell's. Uh, any suggestions on VPN products? Well, well, you you have any uh, thoughts on that, Mr. Paul? Uh, I personally use. I've got two options. I've used uh, OpenVPN, which is more of a well, that's more of a standard than a product, um, but it's really well supported on a lot of routers. Uh, typically goes through firewalls quite well, as it's using standard port 80 and port 443. Mm -hmm. um, but I also have a lot of the peplink 
um, VPN products. Um, yeah. That's primarily because they have the bonding functionality. So that those units are solving a second problem of if your internet at the venue is non-existent or needs supplementation. Um, now, Peplink is involves um, ongoing subscription costs, but it's web managed and super easy to centrally manage a bunch of end units. So if you're in a scenario where you had flyaway kits going out with people who perhaps, they're perhaps not sending a technician, perhaps it's just a, a cameraman or a reporter, um, it can be worth spending a bit more money on something that is centrally managed. Um, but again, as a budget solution, something like a Mikrotik router, which you can pick up fairly cheaply with, um, with OpenVPN on it, can be a, a really quick and um, cost-effective way of doing that. Um, yeah, of course. How do, you like, how do you like them, by the way? I've just recently heard about them. I'm not familiar with them. Uh, Mikrotik, it's, I have a love-hate relationship with them. <laughs> they're, uh, bang for buck, they're pretty yeah. powerful units, but the interface is not great. Uh, <laughs> um, and most IT people I speak to are of the same opinion. Like even experienced people look at the GUI and can't just make something happen without reading some documentation or doing some trial and error. So gotcha. it's that it's, it, it's often that trade-off of you know you spend less on the hardware and you spend more on the time configuring it. If you're doing yeah. it once and then you're going to you know copy that config to a a number of other devices, that can work out. Um, as a once-off, you're probably better off spending a little bit more money on something easier, more easy to configure. Right. Okay. Well, I hear you. Um, in, in, in response to Mark's question, in your handout, there are a couple of spots. I was just showing you a, a, a page that had, well, actually, it's really, it's, it's, it's here. Uh, we have the same thing. So if we're thinking of 568B wiring, which is, of course, <clears throat> what we, uh, we use that here in the United States and, and throughout the world um, as a standard um, for your, uh, for your, uh, our, sorry? Not in Australia. In Australia, we're more of an A standard country. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. No, no, you know, the U.S. is, is you know, we like to think of, uh, we, we, we run it all, but you're, you're right. There are, I mean, the Canadians also are using A. Um, yeah. You know, the nice part is if you have a crossover cable, you can go either way. Um, it's true. But yeah, but uh, we we think of a lot of our stuff as 568B. So keep that in mind when you're looking at this. So for for all you Aussies and, and, and Kiwis and anybody out there who is used to 568B, this is not it. Okay. Obviously, you know, the orange and the green pair are going to flip on that. But for I've been... Sadly, I've been teaching this course mostly in the United States, so I claim uh, I, cl I claim ugly American on this one. Okay, so the 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 middle pins are the ones that we're using for our four wire audio, no matter what color they are. So pin three and six would be typically the audio out of the base station when it's configured in the two matrix uh, configuration. We'll talk about that in a little bit when we see the GUI. Um, and uh, and the pins four and five are going to be into the base station when we're using the two matrix configuration. So this, uh, Mark, and anybody else who's interested, this would be the way to get your four wire audio in and out. Um, obviously you can float pin one, uh, but pin two and three are the ones that are important. Now, here's a little weirdness about the way we do this, just so you know. In general, it's not that important, but if you're really using this to, to send audio, actual audio, and it happens to be uh, phase sensitive, like in stereo pairs and such, you want to make sure you keep phase integrity. No matter what you do, as long as you do it consistently, it'll be okay. But typically, I will tell you that the white green is the positive. So in this case, it goes to pin two. The solid green is the negative. And sadly, uh, I, I drew this horribly. Um, the, the solid blue, which would be pin four, would be your positive. And the yeah. white 
blue, which would be pin five. And again, apologies for not putting the dash in there. That would go to pin three. Okay, and again, that's only important. The, the phase uh, integrity is only important if you're doing stereo pairs or you're doing some, something that requires phase relationships to have integrity. Obviously, from the matrix point of view, it's the other way around. Four, five is from, I, I like to think of it from the matrix port as blue boy, green girl. The blue is the male XLR, the green is the female XLR. Yeah, okay. And by the way, I show you here, this is the pinout for that DB9 that we talked about. This is all in the appendix of the, uh, of the handout that you got. This is, you know, your audio line out, and again, this is from the perspective of the of the LQ box. Audio line out, audio line in, plus and minus, um, and the ground if you need it. They don't necessarily. Um, and then we have our uh, our normally closed, the wiper, and the normally open, which we would use for keying a radio, for example, would be our normally open. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you want to connect it to an iPhone connection. I said FOR22, but it's the same pinout. Same pinout. Right, yeah. just so you know. It's not the same pinout as our uh, um, TW47, which is a little throwdown uh, uh, box for this sort of thing, just so you know. Okay. Um, all right. So we should probably talk, well, okay, before we get into the GUI, one last thing I do want to show you is, and this is a little application note that's in the handout. Um, you know, here we have, you know, I guess it's not so cricket for me to put an RTS product into a ClearCom uh, um, brochure, but it's not a brochure really. It's just, a, it's a pedagogical tool, okay? So RTS, please don't sue me. I'm a nice guy. And we're trying to help you because we know there's a lot of RTS products out there and we want to be able to accommodate them too because we're those kind of guys. So here's an example where you have, let's say, matrix ports or it could be a, a free speak port. Uh, it could be, um, it could even be uh, uh, Bolero. It could be Romeo. It could be uh, 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 BTR, anything with four wire or a, a, a telephone hybrid, whatever goes into this, for, if it's four wire, it can go into our four wire port and goes through the network and we can set it up so that I can plug a BP325 or a ClearCom belt pack, either one, or you know there are other products that emulate both of those uh, styles of two wire comps. You can go in there, not only can we provide the voltage, but we can also provide the termination circuitry and the nulling circuitry all from the LQ box so you can Throw it, you plug it right in at your remote site. It's very convenient. And you'll notice here, I'm going to I show you step by step walk through. When you get to the job, you can refer to this and walk through and shows you each step of the way how to set it up in the GUI. Okay. Now, uh, how's our question thing going on? Are we. Uh, 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 Marty's asking Are the radio audio lines isolated? Hmm. So, as far as, okay, so isolated, you mean like shielded? If, if that's what you're asking, uh, it's always wise to do the, the, the talk and the listen shielded from each other when you're building your cable. Um, I, I, I would have read that, are they transformer isolated? Ah, okay. Uh, so, yes, the, the ports are transformer isolated. And by the way, um, it's always good to uh, to make sure that when you're using power, um, even though you're, you know, we're changing this to DC easily, uh, it's smart to have some kind of a, a, a power protection device in case that, that thunderstorm comes along and pops things. One of the first things to pop is gonna be that transformer at the, per, at the port. But there's a transformer in and a transformer out. Uh, P desk and four, four wire ports will switch will A, B, in, out, on. What are you saying here, Pete? No, Q. Oh, 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 I see what I, you're saying. Relax. You can swap yeah, the yeah, RX and TX. It's on the the matrix or panel. Yeah. In the LQ thought, matrix or panel. So either 
either in is on the middle pair or out is on the middle pair. You can switch it between them. Ah, okay. I got you, got you, got you. Yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll walk through that. As a matter of fact, why don't we um, take a little walk down GUI lane right now, if I can figure out how to get this. I think I have to stop sharing first and then come over here to my Outlook. That's not what I want. Where's Outlook? Come on, Outlook. Really? How long are you looking for that? What do we got? We got another question. Yeah, you do that. Uh, uh, a Mitchells, how well does this work with old crazy telex audio com stuff? Do we still need a telex CCB interface bridge? Uh, if you're using I'm not two wire, with old crazy telex. <laughs> if you're using two wire, then yes, you do. Um, Although there are a lot of those boxes that actually have a, a an Audiocom um, Clearcom switch. Yeah, the Audiocom right. was balanced audio. That was the main right. difference. Right, 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 right. Yeah, so that that little inline transformer, the CC, what was it called? The CCB. CCB. Something? Yeah, uh, CCB one or something like that. That was how you would uh, convert their two wire to or R four wire or vice versa. Um, so if you're using two wire, yes, the answer to your question is yes. If you're using the two wire, then it requires you to, to connect just like you would be connecting to, uh, a, a two wire Clearcom master station. Yes. Yeah. The answer is yes. Um, not a lot of audio com still out there, but it is there. It's out there. Um, I don't recall if Audiocom also has four wire ports. Does any can anybody help me with that? Crickets. Yeah, I'm not familiar with it. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Well, let's talk about a little bit about the GUI here. So here in my incredibly uh, OCD overpopulated browser, which I'm you must have no RAM left on your computer. <laughs> oh no, I don't. I, no. That, that, the RAM is for weenies. Okay, so um, when I type in the uh, IP address, uh, it will allow me to get into this GUI. Now, the first thing it's going to do is ask me credentials. So I'm going to skip that part right now since it already knows this IP address and I can't really trick my computer into going back to the credential page. But take it from me, you type this IP address in, um, you're connected to your device, you're on the same subnet or going through some WAN application, which we happen to be doing at this point, but that's neither here nor there. Um, it'll come up with a credential page. It'll ask you credentials. Just about every product that's out there right now, uh, there are very few products who have gone out the door with, the, with this new paradigm for uh, credentials. But uh, up to now, it's been admin, admin, uh, ID and password. Going forward, it will be admin and your um, MDNS address. That first time, highly recommend if you care to, to change it to something simple. Just write it down so you remember what it is. Okay, so in this case, I happen to be looking at a system that's kind of been configured already, okay? Um, excuse me. Um, this particular system here has uh, two uh, LQ 2W4, 4W4 devices. And you'll notice here all these little icons. I'll explain you what it is for the uninitiated. Okay, you'll see this little LM over here. That means this is the link master. And we'll show you how we do that later. There's Ram, one link. Ram, yep. Let me point, let the users know. You can all zoom in on your screen if you like. There is a zoom button in the middle of your go to webinar browser. If you know, Ram doesn't have to do it. You actual attendees can zoom in on whatever they want to look at. Oh, great, great, no. great, great. Yes, that's true. Okay. Thank you for that, Pete. Okay, so we've named this LQ biggest. It comes out of the box called LQ1 or LQ2 or whatever. I don't know. It has a name it comes out of the box with. But we'll change it. We'll show you how to do that in a minute. You'll notice here I have the, this is the link master and I have my five other slots 
for link members that I can put in and add as I need. Okay, all these now are interacting with each other and happy. The green means happy. Okay, that's Kermit looking at Miss Piggy and smiling with a smirk. That's why it's a crooked smile. You'll see there are two uh, electrical icons here. In both cases, remember the back plane of this LQ box had two, uh, um, uh, what are they, mini DIN connectors, if I'm not mistaken. They look like uh, SVHS. Yeah. yeah. Um, and therefore, the uh, 12 volt uh, DC brick that comes with the box. And you plug two of them in and you have redundancy. But as you can see here, in both cases, we've only plugged one in. We're rolling the dice here, living large. One of them is not connected. That shows up cleverly in red. And the other one is connected, showing up in green. Okay. Now, we notice here that we have a drop down menu for Agent IC uh, users, which none of which we've actually ad adapted to yet. This bar would only appear if one or more of these boxes had licenses engaged upon them to work with Agent IC. And it so happens that both of them do, and we'll see what that is. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to click on this little cog, this little cog right here, and it's going to take me to look at that box's uh, what we call device tab. Now, I could have been in, the, in, 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 in this overview and clicked on device, but I wouldn't be totally sure which I'm looking for, biggest or pod one. So I can, I can toggle here, biggest. Now I'm looking at the biggest box, okay? Now you see here it's called biggest. And here is just like this CCM, and going forward, I don't know if it's gonna change or not, but Right now, the CCM or this browser-based GUI, where you see something that looks like a hyperlink, it's blue and it's underlined, it means that I can change the name, okay? So I can change the name, I'll just add a little exclamation mark there and check it, and now that's the name. Or I could call it, if I wanted to, Mark Kennedy. I think I have enough letters for that, I don't know, maybe not, okay. So, or Marty or whatever. So this box is named that. It has a host name. And again, this is that, a, a piece of this will, will show up as that uh, MDNS host device um, address that we would use in the future. But let's not get too confused with this right now. Okay, so this shows me my general tab. If I get a license to add more Agent IC clients or SIP clients, here's where I would do that. I can do it online or offline. If I'm online on the public internet, I can I get a code from my dealer, pop that in, and then go through a little online rigmarole to get that to activate. If I'm not connected to the internet, which is often the case, what I can do is I can come over here and grab a file that I can use that's a unique file for this particular, it's a context file for this particular box. I would grab it and it would download that file into my browser. I don't know if you can see the bottom of my browser here, but it's right there. And what that does is it gives me uh, a, um, a, a text box which will allow me to send that to my dealer, who will then send it to the passcode people at ClearCom and send you back yet another passcode. So this is like triple checking that, you know, nobody's scamming anybody, it's all on the up and up, and then you could put that code. And once you get that file, you receive that file via e email, you would save it and upload it here. So that's how we do the offline. Maintenance is just going to give you a couple of choices here. One of the things is actually pretty useful, it's sync clock. This allows me to sync the clock for any kind of logging functions that are going to go on. That smoker's cough is getting to me. Um, any kind of logging function can go on will uh, sync to the NTP clock that's on my computer that's controlling this GUI right now. It's, it's a useful thing to do because the worst thing you want to do is have your log not synced to actual real time 
tell our engineers that, hey, here's a log, something goofy happened at 10.15 last night, what is it? And they're looking at 10.15 and everything is honky-dory. So what, yeah. you really want to sync this. It's really important. Uh, and something on the licensing for rental companies that's worth noticing is the licenses are tied to the piece of hardware. You can't right. move them. Right. So if you've got a you know, if you've got a number of devices and some have different licenses to others, which is quite common, you need to be careful which device goes out on which job. Otherwise, you could find yourself short. Yep. There are a lot of companies that are going to ephemeral licenses right now uh, so that you can buy a license for a week or a day or a month or just a year. Um, rental companies like them because they can charge them uh, to their customers and that way they don't have to mess with futzing around with new passwords and stuff. I don't know. I, 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 I see both. Uh, the nice thing about them is the, the ephemeral ones though, I, I believe will be portable as opposed to these, like you say, they're stuck onto that box for the rest of its life. Um, yeah. And, yeah, certainly as from a rental company's point of view, I uh, know they would love to have, you know, to own, X number of licenses and be able to move them between their inventory. Right. So if you've got one big job, you could, you know, compile them all together on one unit. But if you had a number of smaller jobs, be able to split those up. Uh, I understand that's a, we'll see a complicated thing from ClearCom's point of view to manage the licensing. Yeah, you know, but, manufacturing uh, is a whole different uh, brand of voodoo. I don't, I, yeah. I don't get it, and I, I don't want to. But uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm in awe of the people who have to deal with that stuff. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I'm just again, we just a little quick, really quick overviews because we, you know, we don't have all the time in the world here. I, I know it's getting late for the U.S. listeners, and you know, everybody else is. I don't know what, what time is beer thirty in Australia? Um, so we well, look at, the, at the moment. What is time? <laughs> <laughs> so uh reset to default is obviously it'll reset the system to default reboot obviously it's just a soft reboot so that you know i don't have to go and turn my box off physically and the sync clock so that's that's pretty much what that is where things start to get really interesting by the way this shows me the model number and the version which is important you must have all boxes in a networked ring at the same version and you can see this on the front panel of the box also so you know if you're renting some boxes from a company and they won't connect that's the first thing you want to look at maybe they sent you boxes that were not all the same version very easy, very easy to um, to upgrade though. It's that that's that's not you know that's not a problem at all. If I go to my devices page right here, there's my upgrade, and I could go here, select the file, navigate to you know some folder that allows me to wherever I kept it and blah 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 blah. And um, once once I select the file the software will go through a scrubbing process to make sure that that file is not only not corrupt, but it's the correct file for that piece of hardware. It won't allow you to put the wrong piece of uh, firmware onto a piece of hardware. Once it's confirmed that everything's hunky-dory, this upgrade bar will turn blue and you can click it and it will start to send. You'll see a progress bar after it, it's a pretty quick uh, uh, upgrade process, not too long. And then once it ends, the, um, the, the device will reboot itself, come back up and you'll see the new version, either a high version or a lower version, whichever you've chosen will, will reflect here. Uh, things start to get sexy in our network area here. Um, this is where I can set it to be DHCP if I want, or static. Uh, I can set my IP address, subnet mask, gateway. Uh, if I want to use a primary and secondary DNS, I can set it here. And of course, the very important external IP address, which I've had to have sex with some IT guy to get so that I can now get out into the real world. I most likely would set a port. I don't have to, but but you know, it, it's, it's advisable to set the port for this. Uh, I might have a donate, domain name I want to set. Don't need to, but in this case, I don't have to have it. All right. 
And this is where all this stuff goes on. As far as my security stuff goes, this is where I can regenerate a security certificate. Uh, you know, sometimes you need to do that once. And this is also in the rental market where people are changing external addresses all the time. This is, this is a must go. You've got to make sure you have a valid certificate. Um, and uh, these are where you would go through that whole process. Okay. Um, moving along, linking. This shows you where my device that I'm looking at right now, this is the pod one, it's a member. And it shows me I am a link member. And I am looking for the master that is at 172. 31, 32, 24. That's not the address that's in my bar. That address is an external address. This is the actual, uh, if I go to my uh, um, actual, my link master, which is the biggest box, I can see that its address in, internally is that 172, 31, 32, 24. Its external is the number that I've got up here, or or on that network at least, but um, yeah, this this is the number that since these box are linked together in the same room, effectively they have external addresses so that their agent IC clients can talk to them. But because they're in physically in the same room, it's just easier to run that linking over that LAN. It makes it much easier. So that's but what they, we're going to do. But they just as much could be in different countries. They could be in different Absolutely. countries. One could yeah. be on the International Space Station. Anywhere there's internet. So if you if they were divided that, you wouldn't have the local IP address. You'd only have the external IP address. Or would you have no, oh, yes. Only these one boxes box. have yeah. yes. These boxes physically happen to be sitting in our lab in Alameda. Right. Yeah. And they are hooked up onto the same LAN, but that has been bounced to to see that external address has been mercifully routed through that that switch out into the public internet world by the IT gods at Clearcom. So they've been very nice to us and allowed that to happen. But yes, you're right. If one one of these boxes is in Perth and the other one is in Singapore, then absolutely you're going to link it to the external address. That's what you want to do. Yeah, okay? and it might and there's two snap you could still be separate and have the external address be just separate to its main address because right. it's going to depend on whether are you literally connected to that external ip address in which case the lq units ip address is the external ip address right uh, or yes are you inside someone else's network where so if those you two were on a, will be if you were on a public ip that internal uh uh address just would be empty right no. Uh, no, no internal and external would be the same, I believe. Same, same number. number. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, ports. I I could be giving you horrible information right now. You know, I'm I I I know all about <laughs> tubes. I'm pretty good with them. Um, so we've got a couple of questions. Uh, yeah. Marty's asking. Uh, yes. The the age old question. Can we share a file from one unit to another so we can configure units that don't have an internet connection? Uh, so we just had a discussion. Yeah. We have a SWAT team that meets a couple of times a week that we sit on and we've raised this to them. Product management and engineering are aware. They're, um, they're aware of this. It's on the roadmap to happen. At this time, Agent IC does not have a way to save a map a configuration like we do in HelixNet of FreeSpeak 2. I'm sorry. I, I'd open a vein if it would help out. It's not going to, so I'm not going to. But yeah. It, so, so what that means is there's no offline programming of LQ. You have to have access to the hardware. Well, certainly no offline programming of LQ, but you can't even save um, uh, LQ configurations like you can on a FreeSpeak base station or a HelixNet. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's unfortunate. But um, that's just the way it is. Yeah, um, we we are not deaf to your question. We are aware of it. It's actually on a roadmap. Uh, I don't expect to happen, you know, this month or in a month or two. Uh, 
Beyond that, I can't say. I would be kind of a Pollyanna if I would say three or four months, but you never know. You know, uh, it, it something could happen to to drive that into the front of the line. I don't believe it's in the front of the line right now, but it's definitely on the line and in in a decent spot. And Other Pete questions? had a question. Yeah. Uh, can an Asian IC panel customized for a user be easily moved to another piece of hardware, let's say on an Eclipse? Uh, I would go with no. <laughs> um, Absolutely not. No, they're completely different yeah. animals. They, they work in... Uh, uh, no, 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 no. What I mean is an agent IC user that's, let's say, on a port on an LQ box, then mm -hmm. comes to work in the studio and ah. needs to take an agent ah. IC device and use it in the studio, but wants the same 45 buttons on his panel that's already been configured. Okay, that no, but here's what you can do. What, can you see my, uh, my guy here? Yeah, let me, let me set this if up. You move me in really close. Okay, there's a lot of close glare your, there. Close your sharing. Close my sharing. All right, clear there sharing. There we go. Okay, yep. so now I'm gonna, boy, this is hard to do upside down. I'm gonna turn that on, okay? And it's, oh, wait a minute, no, I better not do that. Hang on a second. Uh, let's say I'm on my LQ. Um, Behind his loop. Be quiet. Okay, uh, by the way, that's how you latch a listen. We would have showed him far less skepticism. Right? And that's how you could latch a talk like that. See how it turns bright red there? Or I could do momentary, right? Or momentary this, it brightens, brightens up and then I let go or I could swipe across. Okay, but when I first, when I first see this, I'm gonna log off here. You'll notice, let me close this blind. Maybe that'll give me less glare. <laughs> Sorry about this. I don't know if that's gonna be any better. No, not really. Okay, let's see. Just tilt, it, uh, just tilt it the other way. I'm not a lighting guy. I'm sorry. Put it in your right hand. At, at, and it, well, whatever. Tell us what it's supposed to be looking like. Okay. Look <laughs> at the very top, there are profiles up here. So right now it's set for the LQ profile one. If I tap it, I see it drops down. Oh, I see it. Yeah. And now I have EHX, EHX profile one, two, one, right. two. Right. So let's say I'm on LQ profile one and I log on. I've set up my parameters. Oh, that guy not... really likes to talk. Okay, now I have my, my guy here, right? All right, good. There you go. And that's how it looks on the uh, the eye device. Okay, now I'm going to log out. Say, okay, I'm logging out. And now I'm going to go to my EHX profile one, which I've selected and had already programmed. And now it's gonna to go to uh, connect to a matrix. So now I've got all these, you know, that's the production party line and so the text party line. The answer really is I have to basically in both all three of these systems, set program. up the program to match it among them. I can't take their favorite. And your license you know, won't setting. move from one to another. Got it, the license the is always, has the yeah. license and the configuration of your device what channels are on it and everything are and locked keep into in, that one place. Right, but you also have to keep in mind that uh, uh, a, a device on a, a matrix, on a card on a matrix, is going to have the entire backplane of the matrix available to the agent IC client, IFB. Oh, it's control, much more powerful, yeah. yeah much yeah. more powerful. The LQ device is only gonna give me, the, the maximum I can have is 12 channels. They can be, party lines that I'm using, I can make well, some of them what well, we call what if, private yeah, party that, lines. What if that LQ is connected to a matrix in the studio a million miles away? It can have as many buttons on that but if the as agent, in the no, EHX. But if the agent I see is connected to a matrix, uh, if, I'm sorry, if the agent I see lives yes. on the LQ box, but is connected to the matrix, it could be through a IVC32 or a, a, a IPA card, but it's still only got 12 channels to work with. I can't blow my IFB. I, I can I can send four wire 
channel sorts of things. I so can, you so you can get I a can bigger send the eye of in the studio than away. So I can. Sorry. How many? What's the maximum number of of keys I can have on my agent IC anywhere? Twenty five, twenty four, something like that. At this time, we're working on getting more. But so, depends but upon so your device. When, Some devices when it's won't support. On an LQ, I only get twelve. Twelve channels. Right. Because 12, there are 12, only twelve yeah. channels. Twelve right. keys. Right. Yes. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes. But on a but on a matrix device, you know, there are hundreds of possibilities, but you 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 can only program twenty four keys onto a client that's in the in the software. I could, if I wanted to, on my matrix, have an IFB that I've routed through the IVC32 card to my LQ device, and now I could turn one of those channels as a listen-only IFB right. to do that, but right. I, can't, I can't control an IFB without all kinds of shenanigans. We talked about this earlier is by, this, by this, using the LQ. Is yeah. this because the mixing is being done in the client? No, it's because they're completely different architecture. The architecture that lives on the LQ is 12 channels. Think of it like the difference between okay, a okay, matrix okay. Yeah, and an a, and a, and a RTS 802 well, system. If I want the 24 channels, I have to go over the public internet directly back to my EHX, to my matrix frame, not to an LQ box. That's correct. Right, yes, got correct. it. 24 yeah, discrete buttons. And, and, and th those 24 buttons can be any one of yeah. the hundreds or possibly thousands, not quite thousands, but 1,024 on a matrix, possible <clears throat> ports, I believe. Um, and then if the matrices are linked to other matrices, like uh, TV Global, I think, has like uh, 40 matrices tied together or something like that. They just exceeded the uh, Chinese television. Um, 45 matrices with OB vans and studios and, and, and where they do the telenovas. You could have every single one of those possibilities, but you can only fill 24 holes on the device. At this time, we've made a big push to make more, uh, what we're calling, we're not sure whether it's going to be scroll throughs or tabs or pages. We're not sure hey, how it's going like, to be. Okay. We will have more than the 24 in the, in the not too distant future. Okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, back to the GUI. Let's see. How am I going to get to my Mr. GUI? There we go. Okay. I'm getting the hang of this here thing, this internet web thing. All right. So right now, this device, remember it said four ports of two wire, four ports of four wire. And I see them here and I can check a box. And if I check in the tick box, I can select several or if I just click the name of that port, it will uh, interlink only to the one that I've changed. So now I can go to this, it shuts off the previous one. But if I use the tick box, I can select several of them, okay? So if I wanted to say, I wanted to affect all my four wire, uh, two wire ports, I wanted all of them to be, have the Vox mode enabled, let's say, or I wanted all of them to have a little bit more gain. One thing about two wire you'll notice I don't get a lot of gain up and down. We don't allow a lot of gain up and down because as we said before, in two wire world, any excursion in output gain is going to necessitate some sort of a reduction in input gain because of the nature of the two wire circuitry. So we don't give you a lot of wiggle room for your input output gain. As opposed to in the four wire circuit, if I look at my input output gain, I get much bigger excursions, 12 dB in each direction for input and output. Yep. Anybody see those? Am I still? Yeah, with so it's probably it's probably still worth mentioning um, because we talked about plugging a mic in mm -hmm. earlier, but that mic will need to go through a preamp. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, up, absolutely. Yeah, this is line level, right? Absolutely or close to it, let's say. Now, we talked yeah. before about that matrix port function. This is where you find it. So for example, port number, my four wire port number one might be going into a matrix. Again, it could be a ClearCom matrix, a Riedel matrix, anybody's matrix. Um, 
And uh, I've set the board rate up for this, for an eclipse frame, because I could actually take that port and put it in and expect the 422 data to actually function. It's not going to work if I go into somebody else's frame because we don't we don't share the same um, uh, 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 serial uh, uh, protocol. Um, RTS uses uh, RS. Uh, uh, what is it? Four eight five. What? Is it four eight five on RTS? Uh, yeah. No, their 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 data is buried in the AES CBU. No, it's 485. No, but but the anal for the analog ports, it's 485. It's like right. two-wire uh, serial as opposed to uh, 422, which is two-wire. I mean, four-wire serial, two in, two out. Um, but if I go ahead and click this and go to panel, now I could, if I wanted to, connect this port to, let's say, um, a FreeSpeak2 base station or a HelixNet base station. And that way, what's happening is remembering that, and that, uh, well, I was talking about the 568B wiring, but in the case of, in Australia, if we're using 568A, so the orange pair is surrounding the blue pair. Am I correct? Do I have that right? Yep. I think that's the Good. same in A and B. It's the outer pair that's no. surrounding A and no. B, right? No, it, it does change. So it's, this it's is the, the green color, and the orange yeah, that flip. The green and orange flip in A and B. It so doesn't really five, relate to B. What it is, it's input versus output. It's swapping. Right, exactly. But I'm just talking in color terms right, right. now. But pins three and six, which in, in 568A would be the orange pair, and 568B, which we use in the United States, is the would be the green pair. Anyway, the blue pair is in the middle in both cases. Okay, so three and six, four and five. Okay, and when I flip from the matrix two matrix rather to the two panel as I just did down there. Effectively what I'm doing is I'm switching. I'm doing this to this. So the input is going to go to the output and the output from that device is going to the input of this device. Because in the world of communication, Gazinta has to go into Gazauda and that's just the way it is. So instead of having to build an audio crossover cable, we use this software trick and that's very helpful. Obviously, we don't see that in the two-wire port because in the two-wire port, it's two-wire, it's not four, so I don't have to flip anything. Okay, um, and we do show something here, but with this multi-channel support, if I want this particular port on my LQ box to go to more than one destination, to go to, to and from more than one destination, let's say I want this particular port to be able to not only to go to my FreeSpeak 2 um, four-wire port, but I'm, I, I also, in my little ring in the software, I want that same channel to be able to connect into another, I want that port to be able to connect to more than one channel in more than one device. So this is where I would enable that possibility, okay? Roles, just like we have everywhere else, now, right now, I'm in my LQ world, I'm going to look at my agent IC roles. So let's make a new role. I'll add a role. Okay. And I'll call this role uh, Pete. Okay. And I'll make that add and then I'll close it. And now we'll see over here, there's Pete. And if I check it, I see that's Pete. Uh, you know, and I can change the name. I could make, I could call it Pete Rocks. Okay, there we go. Um, now I can have, we talked about in this case, I have a potential of only up to 12 because I have 12 channels, but I can, let's say, I don't really want channel 12 and I don't really want channel six and Pete doesn't deserve to be on channel four because that's where the, you know, the people who don't dye their hair are. So we have these four channels, but none of them are assigned, but I'm only giving Pete's role, I'm only going to give Pete eight of, out of the 12. And now I can go and assign them by clicking there. And, oh, I haven't configured any of my, cha my channels yet. So uh, let's go and do that. Okay. This, my channel one, these are directs. I just want to look at my channels. What the hell happened here? 
Okay, there's my, I have, I have to configure these channels. So I'm going to make, let's say I'm going to make eight channels that I'm going to use. Okay, there we go. So my channel one, I want to be connected to this two-wire port. So because we see this orange thing here, I'm going to go over there and plop it on. And I want my channel two to be connected to a four-wire port that's over here. Okay, but I also want to connect that other LQ box that's in another building or in another country to this channel too. Maybe that's my production channel. So I'm going to take, but in that case, they only are connecting on two wire. So I'm going to connect that two wire and that four wire are both living in this channel too. I'll go to channel three and I'll say right now I want to put my two wire here, my four wire here, and only my two wire three from the other country or the other city. Now all these are interconnected. Obviously I'm gonna to have to know, I wanna make sure I know, we'd like that. What's a reasonable to... limit on combining two wire ports before you start having trouble knowing? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Three, four? I don't... I don't know the answer to that question. I've never, I've never run into an issue that that had a problem. No, with, if the null that. is good enough, yeah, then it shouldn't matter. Well, the null is never perfect, and I would imagine if you're in the same location with no latency, you might have a problem. But if they're separated by a few hundred milliseconds or a hundred milliseconds, maybe, in different countries, it probably is less of an issue. Yeah, I'm not sure. I've, yeah, I've never never run across that as an issue, but probably never tried to combine a lot of two wires into one party line. Back in the olden days, when they were hardwire hybrids, as opposed to digital, it was an issue right away. After about two, you couldn't do any more. Yeah, no. Like the CCI yeah, 22, true. CCI 22, yep. two is about the maximum you can put on the same circuit. We have much better yeah. nulling nowadays, though. Yeah. So that I don't, I don't know that that's an issue for us. I, I could be wow. wrong, but um, and I often am. Anyway, what I've done here, and you're still seeing my um, my page here. I'm assuming. Yep. What I've done is I've assigned. I can click here and assign a channel. Okay. Now I can't. I can't. I just unassigned it. Once I've assigned. A channel, it's no longer available to. I can't assign that same channel to more than one button on my panel. So, for example, if I go here to my green hair roll, and I go to this first button, I can say I can make that button four, and I can make this button two, and I can make this button eight. But you'll notice each time, excuse me, each time I assign, that list gets smaller. Now, button three, button one, okay? Now, well, the other thing I'm gonna see here is down here, this is attached to that channel. That's just another way for me to program the channel. Well, I can change it to a different channel. See, primary key left, primary key right, secondary key left, secondary key right. What does that mean? So I'm gonna show you how this would be configured in the real world. Okay, so I'm gonna make my first button, just so I show you how it looks like this. I'm gonna make a listen, and I'm gonna make this a not set, and, uh, and I'm gonna make both of these not set. And you're gonna see what I mean by this in a second. Now I'm gonna go to my second channel, and I'm going to make this, boy, are all these, no, oh, I'm in trouble here. Hmm. Who made this map on my guy? Okay, well, I'll show you something different in a minute. I'll make the listen, talk, uh, RMK, whatever. RMK stands for remote mic kill. I can push that button and I can, um, what do you call it? I can uh, kill all the latched microphones that happen to live on, uh, on that uh, that that are on that channel. So if I'm on channel two and I hit remote my kill on my client, 
anybody who had a latched key on channel two, they'd be they'd have their mic killed. So that's convenient. Okay. Wow, what's going on here? I'm in a little trouble. Uh, so while you're looking to... at that, uh yeah, thank you. Brendan had a question. Uh I noticed when you checked all the boxes for two wire ports on the LQ, the null button went away. Is this to ensure a best practice of nulling one port at a time? I yes. would suggest that yes. is exactly what it's for. That's exactly what it's for. You are correct. Yep. Uh, no, you are. I think it's a matter of best, best practices. The computer inside can only do one port at a time. Uh, well, that's also true. Um, yeah. Uh, obviously, when it's set to RTS mode, it's going to do those two uh, uh, XLR connectors are actually one physical port on the, on the LQ box. When I turn it to ClearCom, those two ports then become separate entities. So, but in the RTS mode, you still have to null each side of it separately, channel one, channel two. Yes, yes. Okay, so I'm not seeing a, any map here that's going to be helpful to me, but that's okay. I'll show you what I mean. So once I've set this up with my primary and all this stuff, if you can see here, uh, this is a, somebody's different map, but you'll notice that I've got my, this is my production party line here, and my CCMG happens to be here, and I have a talk and a listen. If I touch these three little tiny circles here down at the bottom, it's going to flip that around, and now it shows me I have a call signal that's actually, when I push that, I sent a call signal to that channel, and I could actually populate the RMK. The other thing that's nice about that page is I have this slider bar here, that I can individually control the volume of only that channel. And as you see, it rubber bands back after I let go of it for a while. And if somebody does make a call to my channel, I would see it come up here in like a reply key. And I could actually push that button and talk to whoever sent that call, which is actually convenient if I have a long list, I don't wanna scroll down and find out where the guy was. So that's entertaining. That's how you program this stuff. By the way, uh, when I'm when I'm in my start screen, God, that's way. Too, maybe if I make it not so bright, it'll be easier to see. Yeah, there you go. It's just like with TSA, just the opposite. So if I go into settings and I can come over here and I can set my username, my password, what the um, IP address of the device that I want to connect to. What's the port? Once I've got all those set, and remember, I'm gonna show you a second how we set it in this piece of software for the client to adhere to. Once that's done, I can come out of that and just hit start, and it'll take me to where I need to be. And in this case, this client only was programmed two devices, a party line and a point to point to Justin MG, who's my boss. So that's how we do that. Okay. One other thing, by the way, uh, when you're not using Agent IC, shut it off. It's a battery hog, just so you know. Okay. So how do we program that? Um, so if we come over here to my accounts tab, and okay, I've come over here and let's say, I know for a fact that I have eight licenses. I went to the device, I looked up license, and I have eight Agent IC licenses. So right now in my accounts tab, I'm noticing I've only set up for three. So I could add another five of these guys. So let's add one more, okay? And we'll call this one uh, Paul, okay? And I'll make the user ID, I always make the user ID in lowercase because it's easier to type that way on your phone or tablet. So this is what the user is going to have to use for user ID. So I can go Paul. And if I want to, I can give it uh, a, um, a password. I can make it complicated or not. Um, and or I can make it none. So if I make it none, it's blank and the user doesn't need a password to get on. Not recommended, but it could be done. What role do I want it to use? 
In this case, I want it, let's say I want Paul to use the A2 role because he's being demoted to A2 today, okay? And then which LQ assignment do I want it to be on? Well, in this particular case, I'm looking at biggest, so I'm gonna assign him to biggest and set that up. I've now accepted that. Now I can add another client. And again, I can add up to the amount of clients that I'm licensed for, okay? So now, now I can make it. Going back to my question of yesterday, it seems like, uh, I've got uh, for Paul, I've got a, a, a agent I see client set up with a bunch of things on it. Mm -hmm. And here I can move it between LQs within the same system. Which within essentially the same moving system. In between different licenses. Well, right, but they're recognizing, but the devices recognize that they have licenses to each other. The fact of the matter is, I don't think it's that necessary because once it's on the network connected, they're all talking to each other anyway. Well, if let's say one LQ was in, in New York and one was in Cincinnati and I walk into the next city and I. Ah. Yeah. I want to take my my thing, which is on the network, uh, so to, to get lower latency. Different Wi-Fi system, maybe. I can yeah. just assign my my role to a different LQ assignment. Yes, you can, but the actual license has to live on that box. Right, it but it can't move off of the box. The license is not necessarily with the role, is what I'm saying. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, yes. And by the way, yes. yes. No, you're so you can have correct. you can have more roles than you have licenses. Right, and you can use the role wherever in the system you want to be, and it doesn't have to be on a particular agent IQ license. It can be on any of them as long as right. it's open. Right. right yeah. Right, right. Correct. So, so if you've got a day shift and a night shift, you could have right. different roles for the different shifts. You'd only be able to, the license limits the number of concurrent right. connections. The 10 day people can share the same 10 licenses as the 10 night people. Correct. Yeah. As long as they don't try and cross over. Everybody uh, gets the app for free. Every phone in the world could have it, but in order but in order to log into an actual living frame or or or, or box, you'd have to have a client that's that's configured for that box that you have the credentials for. Then I log in. No. Let's say I call it user one, user two, user three. This, these three people are working. They're done with work. They log off. Now the next shift comes on. They go to user one, user two, user three. How do however, you, can you, however, I may want to say that the afternoon or the evening guys really want something different. So I go into my GUI and I say user one, instead of doing that role, I want you to do the ROM role. Now when they log on, they're going to have the ROM role. And what if ROM wants to reserve his log on so nobody else can steal his agent IQ port? Well, there are a couple of ways that that happens. First of all, I give myself, hang on a second. I give myself, let's do this. Oh, come on. Is this on biggest? Where are we? Yeah, no. That's not, I give my, what I do is I get, let's say I, okay, I come over here, I make this the ROM role, the ROM, the ROM uh, client. Right. Okay. And I'm going to call my, uh, make it easy for me to hear. But what I'm going to do here is to, uh, I'm going to make a really complicated uh, password. That's associated with the port now. Right. So nobody right. else can find it. Okay. Got it. Right. And, uh, and I'll say that's ROM. But what I would what I would do more than that is, you know, in this case, I'd make it ROM. If everybody wants to be ROM, which apparently everybody does, because I I'm, do. You know, I'm, yeah, of course. Why not? I could make a ROM asterisk role, which I would take and not allow anybody else to. Since I'm programming it, I would not allow anybody else to have it. I would not give it to anybody else. And again. It's not like in uh, FreeSpeak or HelixNet where I could have dynamic roles where I could turn my agent IC client on and scroll through a list of roles. That's not how this works. So, so this this is the agent IC users, and can only be you can't have more users than there are licenses. That's correct. At any given time, on on the on the show. 
Now, well, someone you, else. Can this list go above, let's say this is a, 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 an LQ box, one LQ box. I can only have eight. Right. Oh, I, but what, then I have to go into this particular screen and change the roles between shows? Yes. I thought you could have more roles than you have licenses, provided yes. they're not signed in at oh, the same no, time. Oh, no, no, absolutely. You can make as many roles as you like, but you can have users. I don't think, let me let, I, I don't believe you can. Let's try it here. Okay, let's just see how many users it's going to allow me. I think it's going to shut me down. Interesting. Well, you've got two boxes here. It's probably so you've got six, sixteen licenses, Mary. Right. Ah, uh, that's why. Yeah. Okay. But my assignment. Let's see. Let Let me see if I put them all. I'm going to put all these over the biggest. Yeah, and this relates to Mark Kennedy's question of with two LQs, do you have sixteen licenses? And right. the answer is yes. You do. But you but can only have eight connected to each LQ. No, it's not. Well, let's see. I got one more to do here. Biggest, 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 yeah. biggest, biggest. Let's. Okay, drum roll, please. I don't understand. Now I'm confused. No, that's because one of those people will not be able to join at the same time as so, everyone else. So the agent IC users can be as long as you make it but only 16 in this case will be able to log on. Right, right, yeah. right, right. And then back Whereas to my you... question, what if I wanted to make it so nobody could steal my slot in the 16? I think the only way to do that would be to not allocate more than 16. Yeah. I don't yeah. think there's I mean, a no, way of- permanently, permanently privatize one slot. I no, well, I, so. I don't know anybody who makes more than the allotted amount of, of user well, list in, slots. In your example of daytime crew, nighttime crew. No, but that's, that, yeah, that, yeah. okay, here's my example. Maybe I didn't phrase it correctly. Let's say I have five clients, but I'm the engineer in charge, and I want to have my, my client sacrosanct. So right. I give I give it maybe a crazy name and a really whacked out password that only I know. Okay. Right. But then I make user one, user two, user three, user four. Remember, I have five all together. Okay. Right. I call user one, user one, because user two, user two, and so on and yeah, so yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or maybe I make it uh, photog one, talent one, photog two, talent two. Could do it like that. But, but, in, but in this case, they all have to, have to share the same role. Or or I go in and edit this screen. No, every I, I make a I no I make a new role for for each client because in the in the practical world they they don't move the roles around that much. I'm sure there are applications where the morning guys have to do something completely different than the evening yeah. guys. Maybe like in a nuclear plant or something. There's there's different tasks, but more often than not, user one has to be you know, the guy who's running camera in the studio might run around, he might need, uh, you know, the party line for the cameras, might need the production party line, maybe a point to point to the A1 and the graphics guy in the news desk. And everybody who has that user one uh, 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 job is going to need that same workflow, therefore use the same programming. That guy leaves, the 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 evening girl comes in and she's right but they're they're largely that. doing the same job absolutely but what if i was using this system in my fly pack and i was doing show a for one client and show b for another client yeah. and i can't save this file to reload it right that's what i'm saying you make all the roles in the first place i can make I can make a buttload of roles. As many okay? as you want. So I, I would just have to go ones. into the account <laughs> screen. <laughs> right. I'd have to go into the account screen and change all the roles in the clients. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's not ideal. No. But that, yeah. yeah. At that point, Unless, you to buy an Eclipse. Yes. But you could make a lot of logins as long as you're not going to try and use them all at the same time. Right. Correct. Correct. Okay, cool. 
So, um, uh, yeah, and to, and associated with the, the Mark's question about the licenses. Yeah. Uh, I think in most situations, you'd probably leave the the selection of which LQ it's going to connect to to any. So that way you'd be able to access all the licenses. Correct. But there may be, you may want to choose an LQ, uh, <laughs> particularly if you are talking about different cities, just to make sure that you're connecting to the local LQ and not the, right. you might have right. network access to all of them. Um, yeah. You don't want to be connecting, standing in Perth, connecting to Sydney just sure. for the sure. sake of it. <laughs> um, you know, there, there are, there are, look, these programs are deep and there's a lot of things we can play with. Um, I know we've gone over our time and I don't want to push it too hard. Um, if people are interested, we could do some follow-up stuff. Um, you'll see Paul's and mine email address at the end of this. Um, also, Pete is very knowledgeable in this and, and, and Kelly and Mac and all the guys. So take advantage of that. And, um, you know, we, uh, if, if you have some questions that we didn't ask here, make sure you email, smoke signal, do whatever it takes to get this information because we're here to help you. And this is a time now where you all get to catch up. Um, yeah. Paul, anything to add there? I was just going to throw a, a curly one in that some people might find interesting <laughs> because at the moment there's not an agent IC desktop client. You can do a little trick using an Android emulator to run the Android version of the app on Mac and Windows. Oh, really? So okay. That can, yeah. So I use the emulator. It's called BlueStacks. If you Google yeah, that, too. you'll find it. Me too. And you literally install the Android app as if it was on a phone, and you've now got Agent IC on your desktop, which can be plus really handy the, for workflows. Plus all the cool games that you would load on your phone to waste your time in the times like these. <laughs> one, thing, <laughs> one thing about BlueStacks, it's, uh, I use it often. I would not use it in a mission critical situation because um, I have never experienced this, but I've heard that sometimes it burps and um, it doesn't work with every iteration of every operating system on uh, laptops. Um, but it's definitely something cool to try. And again, I, you know, not everybody out there has the products and has the, you know, the money to buy licenses and all that stuff, but everybody can get H and IC and Everybody knows everybody. You know, we 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 know each other, and we've got our our Facebook or our, our cell phones. We can communicate. Download it and try it out amongst your little group. Play with it. It it it's won't be connected live, into an live, actual world. live system. You can actually talk on production yeah. around the yeah. world. And it's fast. It's really fast. Um, I wouldn't want to do a show on it because you know you never know when some guy in Germany might be uh, <laughs> demoing the system in the middle of your you know call for the guy to jump through the fire hoop but yeah play with it it's it's fun it sounds really good um there's a uh there's a video on the clearcom website uh livex is a company uh in new york it's a production company and they do the ball drop in times square every year they actually have all their production people running around using it and they made a video of it it's very cool they've adapted uh david clark headsets with the tip ring ring sleeve connector for their for their phones and um, it works great. And if you can imagine what the RF environment in Times Square is like on New Year's Eve and the phone traffic, it's pretty reliable. I don't have it turned on, but I have this phone, which is a Sonom XP8, yep. which is uh, a military grade uh, cell phone with the screen on full brightness. I have 16 hours of battery life in it. Hmm. Wow. And I can interface it to push to talk buttons or headsets or four pin XLR or whatever as my headset. And it runs uh, uh, Android, uh, 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 any Android uh, client. You have the best toys, Pete. Hey, what, what's, <laughs> what's life about but to have toys? You know, exactly, exactly. Absolutely. Anyway, this has been a terrific, terrific show. I think we've done now the nine different ClearCom shows. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, every single time 
we listed as talking about Agent IC and we never quite get to it. <laughs> I think we've covered more on Agent IC on this yeah, particular did. show than we ever have before. And I, but there's still some left for the next ClearCom event. So we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll come back to this definitely. And okay. I hope all the people in Australia and uh, Asia, the one or two that I saw from Asia that logged on, uh, enjoyed it. And of course, you can come back and watch this again on our uh, archive, either on YouTube or on our website. And yeah, don't, don't you, forget to get our email addresses down there too. Yeah, the, the email addresses are right down there. Uh, and you uh, uh, can, um, the questions that were all listed will be in the handout along as long as this, as well as the handout item, the ClearCom handout will be on the website as well. So time for you all to go to lunch in Australia now. So, and, and for us to go to bed. So uh, thank you very, very much for joining Thanks, us. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Pete. <laughs> no, thank you for you organizing know, one in our time zone. We were on. I don't know how you figured that out. Anyway, I, I, it's just part of the service I provide. Anyway, Kelly and Mac both had to go to bed because it was past their dead time, bedtime. So they're going to say <laughs> goodbye uh, virtually, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Cheers. Right. Thank you. Uh,